Uh, I'd like to introduce our next keynote speaker. Um, it is Susan Weinsheng, uh, Dr. Susan Weinsheng. She's a behavioral psychologist and founder and CEO of T the Team W, uh, which includes many Fortune 1000 clients, including startups, governments, and nonprofits. She's the author of several books, including one I even use in my own class, um, called 100 Things Every Designer Needs to Know About People, 100 More Things Every Designer Needs to Know About People, and How to Get how to get people to do stuff. Um, she's also the co-host of the Human Tech Podcast and has a column in Psychology Today Online. So please welcome Susan Weinsheng. So glad to be with you today. So I'm a psychologist, I'm a behavioral scientist, and I just am fascinated by human behavior and also about neuroscience. So one of my favorite things to do is to read really nerdy science research about what's going on in the brain. And um, not too long ago, I came across some research about what's happening in the brain when we are doing something creative. And you know, I was like, oh, this is interesting. Um, and then, uh, and I, I put that on our list of, you know, keynotes that we give, and every now and then someone asks for it, but when uh, Gretchen McKenzie contacted me to speak at this conference, I, I don't know if I suggested that or I just handed her the list and hoped that she would pick it, and she did, right? no surprise, right? So I want to talk to you today about the science of creativity, and there's three things I really want to do um, today in the time we have together. One is I want to share with you what is what is it that we know about what's happening in the brain when we're going through a creative process? And then, based on that, I want to share with you, number two, um, what then is the best stuff to do so that you're working with the natural way that the brain works when it's being creative instead of against it? Some tips and techniques. And then the third thing that I want to do before we're done is we're actually going to have you apply that um, to your own situation. So when you're all done, you'll have some really concrete things that you either can keep doing that you were doing before, but now you'll know why they work, and then maybe some new things that you haven't thought about trying based on how we know how the brain works. So does that sound good? All right. So um, I have uh, two helpers here who are going to help me hand some stuff out. The first thing that we're gonna, I'm going to hand out to you, um, what? Go for it. Yeah. Um, the uh, coffee filters, please. So everyone's going to get a uh, coffee filter. It's no trick to it. It's just a regular coffee filter. Um, and what I'm going to ask you to do now, this first thing that I'm going to ask you to do, I'd like, you know, we will be doing some things together with, with a team or with a partner. But this first task I want you to do I want you to do individually on your own. So uh, if you do have, uh, you need some way of documenting ideas, whether that's a pen and paper, or I guess you could write right on the coffee filter, I don't know. Uh, or if you don't have pen and paper, uh, you know, maybe you can use something on your phone to take notes with. But I'm going to uh, give you, once all the, I'm waiting, I'm stalling here as the coffee filters get given out. Uh, I'm going to be giving you, from the time I say go, you're going to have 60 seconds, and I will time it, don't worry about the timing, to write down uh, on your own without the use of a partner, write down as many ideas as you can come up with about what you could do with that coffee filter, um, and besides make coffee. All right? So I'm still going to wait here until everybody has their filter. All right, Either your, your 60 seconds begins now.
Okay, time is up. You can put uh, your coffee filter down. You can put your notes down. I'm going to tell you later why I had you do that. Uh, actually, I just enjoy sitting here in silence while I'm counting and having people walk in the room and go, what the heck are we doing in here? <laughs> no, so we'll come back to the coffee filter in a minute. So let's talk a little bit about what's going on in the brain. But first I thought I'd share with you, I mean, you know, it's like, what, is, what does creative even mean? This is possibly something that this audience thinks about a lot. This is um, a definition that I kind of really like. So creativity is the process of generating new ideas, possibilities, or alternatives that result in outcomes that are original and of value. So the things to, that I think are important in this that I kind of like when I think about creativity is first of all that term process, that it's not just that you end up with something that someone says is creative, but it's that process of, of going through it. Um, ideas, possibilities, alternatives, and then there is some kind of outcome. There is something at the end, and that, that, that thing that you ended up with after you went through the process has some amount of originality at it, in it, and it is also a value, and I don't, you know, I don't mean monetary value, but just a value to someone, which might be just you, but that's absolutely fine. And that's kind of a definition of creativity that, that I found somewhere that I, that I really like. But I want to talk about um, the brain, and I want to talk about these, um, what's called three brain networks. So when you are being creative, whatever it is, whether you're solving a problem, uh, that you, know, you're, you have a team that you work with, and these two people aren't getting along with those two people, and you've got to figure out what to do, to me, that's creativity, that's creative problem solving, whether it's some kind of engineering problem that you're trying, like Austin was talking about, how do we build this thing for Burning Man, or whether you're creating art, whether you're creating music, um, whatever that creativity is, there's three brain networks that are active. Now, I want to talk first about what a brain network, what does that mean? Why am I using the word network? So, um, there are some structures, and, and you know, so this is where we're going to get a little bit nerdy, uh, but believe me, I won't, it won't get too bad here. I'm not going to, uh, it'll be on the final. No, there isn't fun. Um, there are structures in your brain that do very particular things. So there's a part of your brain, for instance, that's all about speaking, that's going to be active when you're talking. There's a part of your brain that is going to be active when you're moving. There's a part of your brain that's going to be active when you're doing fine motor skills. But then there's some of the things that we do where there's no one place in the brain. There's no brain structure. For example, some people are surprised to find that reading, you are not born with a part of your brain dedicated to reading. You're not. The brain actually has to steal resources from various places in order for you to read. And so it's a little bit of uh, actually uh, uh, sound when you're reading, believe it or not, even though it's visual. There's some sound. There's language, comprehension part of your brain. There's the uh, uh, pictorial representation part of your brain when you're reading. And so what's happening when you're reading is you're actually creating a network of different parts of your brain that act together for you to do this thing called reading. And that's what a brain network is. It's when multiple parts of the brain work together. Um, and we're going to see how this works. So there are actually three different networks in the brain that are active when we are doing something creative. And they are active, the three different ones are active at different points in time. And that's what I'm going to explain. So the first one, which is the areas uh, in, the, in the illustration that are green, um, that is, the first one that's active is what's called the executive attention network. And the executive attention network is the part of, of your brain, the parts of your brain that are active when you are concentrating, when you are thinking really hard, when you have that focused thought. That's the executive attention network. So that's the first brain network we're going to talk about. The second brain network we're going to talk about is something called the imagination network. I did not name it. 
It sounds to me like something Disney would come up with. Come see, in Disney World, we now have the imagination. No, but that's uh, the, the people who came up with this idea of the brain networks, they called it the imagination network. That's the part of the picture that's red. And what the imagination network does is it sifts through what you know and what you've learned and what you've experienced. It sifts through all that information to come up with ideas. And I'm going to tell you kind of the story of how these three networks work together. But that's network number two, the imagination network. And then network number three is the one shown in yellow. And it's called the salience network. And the salience network kind of monitors what the other networks are doing. And it's looking for good ideas, which it brings up into consciousness. So I want to talk about how this works. So let's say, I mean, I, I um, one of the things I do that I think is, engages a lot of my creativity is uh, I uh, write music. I compose music. And so let's kind of walk through how do these three networks work if I'm doing something like writing a, writing a song. So we're going to, you know, we start with the executive attention network, right? Remember, that's the first one. So I would think, you know, I have this song that I'm working on. And it's, it's like I can't, you know, I got the verses okay, but I can't, like the chorus is just eluding me. You know, it's like I, I, don't, I, I don't know where the song is going. I have the little beginning, I have a few snippets, and then I don't know what's happening. So the first thing I would do then is focus my attention and say, I really wish I could get the, a good chorus for this song. That's the executive attention network. I'm focusing. I'm saying, this is the problem I'm trying to solve, or this is the creative thing I'm trying to create. So that would be, then, our first one. And then what would happen is the imagination network will automatically go to work on this idea. And the imagination network is happening largely unconsciously. I am not aware of what it is doing. I'm not aware of it sifting through my knowledge and experience. It's just going to do that on its own. And then at some point, I'm going to get an idea for that chorus. It's just going to come to me. And um, what often happens to me, uh, we'll talk about this later too, uh, is, and that's the salience network, it comes to me in the shower. I write all, like, almost all my music in the shower. Uh, my husband complains because I take really long showers. You know, it's like, are you still in there? Wait, I almost have it. Yeah, I got the lyrics coming now, you know. And uh, he's rolling, rolling his eyes at me. But, you know, wh what, happen what happens is that things start to come up. That's the salience network. That's the salience network having sifted through the, all the activity in the imagination network, the salience network then says, oh, hey, here's an idea. Listen to this. Um, and that's how the creative pro that's what your brain is doing. The executive attention network is the conscious part, but the other two, imagination network and salience network, are both unconscious. They are happening unconsciously. And actually, um, you know, about 90% of all of our mental activity, by the way, is unconscious. So it's no surprise that these two brain networks are happening unconsciously as well. So that's how these three networks are involved in the creative process. So let's kind of talk through a little more detail. So the first thought I want to leave you with is that you have to be really clear about what it is you want to create or what the problem is that you want to solve if you are to engage that executive attention network. Now, you can, I mean, you can go with one idea and then change your mind and go with another idea. It's not like you must take that one idea to the to the end. But if you're not clear, your imagination network has a really hard time knowing what knowledge to sift through. And your salience, salience network has a really hard time knowing what's a good idea that it should bring up into your consciousness. Because you haven't been really clear on what it is you're working on. So that's the first thing, is to be as clear as possible about what you are working on. Um, and then the next thing is to let go. Because that imagination network needs to do its thing. And the tricky thing is 
Every time you engage your executive attention network, the imagination network gets quiet. It's like, oh, we're concentrating on something else. So then you concentrate, and then your imagination network goes, oh, here's something I can work on. But then you concentrate on something else, and the imagination network goes quiet. And you never give your imagination network a chance to work on one thing. And that's why you need to focus, and then you need to let go. And you know, a lot of the things I'm going to talk about today, you've all experienced, right? How many of you have been out walking the dog, or weeding the garden, or washing the dishes, or doing something, and you get an idea? It's like, oh, that's an interesting idea, right? We all know that there are, we, it's, it's important if we're working on something really intensely that we sometimes walk away. We sometimes just walk away. So you guys, my helpers, come on up here again. So um, as we go through these uh, different ideas, you want to pass out these worksheets? Um, I want us to stop, actually, and uh, reflect. Now, these worksheets that are coming out, there are 11 different items on them. I'm really making you work hard. But I don't want you to do all 11, all right? So what I'd like you to do is, on your own, I want you to work just on numbers 1, 2, and 3. And start by working on your own, just numbers 1, 2, and 3. So we're going to actually, as we go through, we're going to practice what we're talking about for something that you are particularly interested in. So when you get your worksheet, I'll give you a, a couple minutes to answer question one, two, and three. OK, so what I'd like you to do is um, find a partner to work with, uh, or groups of three at the most. Don't do more, more than three, because it slows everything down. So find someone to work with, or two other people to work with, and just have each of you share uh, what you wrote down for one, two, or three. And if someone says something, for instance, on uh, two or three that you think is interesting, you know, steal their idea and write it down in your sheet. So take a, maybe about two minutes or so to find a partner, share with them what you wrote down, and they'll share what, you, what they wrote down. You guys are so easy to get your attention again. I was um, teaching a workshop in uh, Tel Aviv uh, not too long ago, and um, the workshop organizer said, uh, are you going to have like interactive activity? And it's like, oh yeah, I always have interactive activities. He goes, okay, I have to warn you, you know, these are, we, we're all Israelis. It's like, okay, yeah, I'm in Tel Aviv. I thought you'd be Israelis. He said, yeah, but you get them talking, they won't stop. And I said, oh, no, 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 I'm really good with crowd control. You know, I can get them to stop. Wow, they were the toughest. They were the... And, so, and I have, I, I didn't bring with me, I, I usually do, I have like whistles, I have all noisemakers, you know, that I do into the microphone. Didn't phase them a bit. They were just going to keep on talking. And it was like, okay, this will be... But you guys were good. All right, so... We've talked then about focusing. We've talked about uh, different ways we might let go and let that imagination network do its thing. So now let's talk about the next step. Because we said the salience network was always monitoring everything and that it would come up with some ideas and then it would bubble that up into conscious thought. And you know, we don't know when that's going to happen. It could be five minutes after you. Decide, you know, you set that executive attention network. It could be five days. It could be five weeks. I mean, I guess if it's a really hard problem, it could be five months, right? So you actually don't know when you're going to get these ideas. So you have to be ready. You have to be ready to always capture stuff that comes up. And again, you guys, you know, a lot of you are very creative people, and you probably experience this, which is, um, you know, you get a really good idea. And you don't capture it, and you think, oh, well, I won't forget that. It was a really good idea. And then what happens? You absolutely forget it. And you know, then it's like, well, it, if it's a really good idea, it'll come back. Well, not necessarily, right? And so you have to have ways to capture these ideas. And um, 
you know, it depends on, you know, maybe you need a sketchbook. Um, uh, I kind of always have paper and pen handy. I always am using my phone uh, to record stuff. Um, I have not tried putting the phone in the shower yet. I probably don't want to do that. Uh, but I always have it right outside the shower, and I've been known to, you know, run out of the shower. And because I'm composing music, you know, I'll pick up the phone and I'm singing some little weird thing. And, you know, uh, the interesting problem, especially, I'll wake up in the middle of the night with, you know, a song, snippet. And I'll grab my phone and I'll, you know, it's like two in the morning, you know, and I'm, I'm like trying to sing really quietly, you know, and sing into my phone. And the next day when I listen to that, it's like, what the heck was that? <laughs> like, I can't even, it's raw, 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 you know, it's like makes no sense at all. But you want to have as, as much as possible ways to capture it. Um, I mean, you don't, all of this stuff, why would you work against your brain when you could work with your brain? Now, let's see. I may not have, OK. Yeah, here's the tech. So I have in my shower waterproof paper um, and a waterproof pencil. It's kind of cool. And it really, it really works. It really works. And I, I, I have sometimes, you know, house guests will come, come down to breakfast and get, what's with the pad of paper and the pencil in the shower? Like, what is that about? And then one day, I was capturing something, and I turned the page, and there was a note <laughs> from one of my house guests saying, you know, hope this, this is a good idea you just had, you know? And I thought that was pretty funny. So she had turned the page a couple pages later, so I wouldn't find it right away, you yeah. know? Um, but yeah, I mean, they, there's all, uh, that's technology that I use because, and again, this goes back to the fact that I know I'm going to have so many ideas in the shower. Uh, I've, I've pretty much written most of my books in the shower. Uh, not literally, but like, you know, came up with the ideas and then ran out of the shower and started writing. Uh, I, when I, years ago, when I was working on my PhD in psychology, I wrote my dissertation in the shower. Okay. For some reason, the water, running water, just helps me. I don't know why. But you definitely want to um, capture it. So let's talk about some more tips and techniques. And I think some of these you'll recognize as things you already know how to do. But now what I'm hoping is you'll understand why they work, uh, because you understand something about how the brain works. So you should assume that you need a lot of iterations, right? I mean, anybody who does creative work, um, iterations are good. Uh, you don't have to get it right the first time. Um, uh, when I'm composing music, I sometimes feel like uh, if you've ever had the experience of being in an apartment or a hotel room that didn't have really, really good soundproofing, so you could kind of hear what was going on in the next room a little bit. You could hear like a you know, like muffled conversation. And sometimes when I'm writing music, that's how the I feel like the song is coming to me. It's like I can. I can almost, almost hear it. I can, I almost, almost have it, you know? I get, oh, there, I heard that, I heard that. Um, and so it takes a while, it takes lots and lots of iterations um, for it to finally come into being. So there's nothing wrong with iteration. I think sometimes, um, and you know, I work, uh, a lot of the design work I do for my business is like digital design and app design and software design. Um, applying behavioral science to design. And sometimes I'm working with uh, web designers. I, t I also am an ad adjunct professor, and I teach uh, aspiring web designers. And it's almost like they feel like they have to get it right the first time. Like, they have to get it right. Uh, as though there really is, like, one right way to do, you know, any of this stuff. And so I have to teach them that process of iteration. Another thing that I think really helps with being creative and in terms of the way the brain works is to embrace imperfection. Um, you know, if, you, if it has to be perfect right now, then you, you'll, you'll just stall. Like, it's OK that it's not perfect, because uh, I know I can keep iterating and I can keep working on it. All right. Um, Let's see. Before we come back to our coffee filter, would you guys 
take your worksheet out again and do questions four and five that have to do with capturing your ideas. How do you capture your ideas now? And what are some new ways you could capture? So fill out four and five. And then just hold on to your answers to four and five. We'll have you share those in a minute. Uh, but let's go back to our coffee filters. Uh, so you had your list of things you could do with a coffee filter, right? So now what I want you to do is find a partner to work with. And I encourage you, you can use the same partner you had before, but I encourage you to stand up and go find somebody somewhere else in the room that you haven't met and you haven't talked to and uh, you know, create a new partner for the coffee filter one. So if you want to, stand up, move around, might be good. Uh, go find someone to work with. And what I want you to do is just share what you wrote down for the coffee filter, what they wrote down, and then I want you to see if together you can come up with new coffee filter ideas. So find someone to work with and come up with new coffee filter ideas. Anyone want to share their, their craziest coffee filter idea that came out? Make a sleeve cup. Make a sleeve cup. Sounds very uh, like Elizabethan English or something. Yes. A taco holder, so the, so the taco doesn't get all over you. Or, oh, right, only that kind of filter, yes. For a little army guy. Okay, yes. A tent for a poly pocket, ah, uh, yes. A skirt for a Barbie doll. A very, oh, a very small, she's, she did this so discreetly. A very small child that's ill, this might be convenient. Yes, and I, I, I like the subtlety. Yes. A, a small insect, oh, I like it, to get the insect, to get the spider out of your kitchen and it, outside. Yeah, I like that, yeah. These say they both came up with lampshades, and they want to know if anyone else came up with lampshades. We have a, f a few, but not a lot. They're a little unique. Yes. A little paper airplane. Yeah, all the way in the back. You're going to start a fire? Okay. Not right now, though. Okay, yeah. Confetti. Celebratory confetti, yes. Uh, cut up, cut out a paper snowflake. Okay, yeah, yes. A little hat for your cat. Oh, can we start a meme? Can we get as many cat hat pictures going as as we can? Yes. Go ahead. For for protection from for from sun for a what? Sea lake for plants. For plants. Oh, that, all right. Yes. Transfer plants. Yeah. And you can save seeds. Yes. Origami. Yes. A very temporary, <laughs> very temporary cup. Yeah, so a canvas or, or a prop. So great, great ideas, of course, I thought this group might have like really good ideas. I gotta tell you, when I do this in other places, sometimes the, it's like, oh, I don't know. Yeah, because you guys are more creative than, than most. All right, so um, let's talk for a second about collaboration. Uh, when you talked with your partner about the ideas, um, that was probably interesting. They probably had ideas you hadn't thought of. Maybe that even spurred more ideas. Oh, yeah, you know, you could do this and that. Collaboration, you know, I, I, sometimes some people like working with others to be creative. They like being creative through working with others. Some people like working solitary. They prefer working solitary. 
Um, some activities are better, you know, easier to do collaboratively, some are easier to do alone. But collaboration is, is, can, you know, open up so much because, you know, you've got your brain and you've got your imagination network going based on your knowledge and experience. And they've got theirs, which is a whole nother realm of knowledge and experience. And so, wow, you bring those two together. Now you have this huge world. And that's why you get so many different ideas. And the research shows that the more diversity you have within the, with the people who are collaborating, the more ideas you'll have, of course, because their knowledge and ideas are different than yours. Here's a really simple example of that. There was some research done with teams working together, and I think they were probably software engineering teams, I, it, won't, it doesn't really matter. But um, they, they had the team, they, they put together teams that of very, you know, people who are very alike, like people who maybe grew up in the Midwest of the US, you know, and then teams who were not very alike, like people from India and California and the Midwest and London and so on. So they had homogeneous teams and very diverse teams. And all they did was ask the teams to come up with a list of condiments that they might put on a hamburger or a hot dog. That was the task, right? And the teams that were very homogenous came up with a really, you know, kind of normal list of condiments like ketchup and mustard and that kind of thing. But the teams that were divert, you know, apparently there are parts of the world where they put all kinds of, you know, fish sauce goes on the ham. I mean, it was just like all kinds of very odd things that to them were not, to me, what seemed odd. But to those people, it was not odd. It's like, well, that's, well, that's what we put on hamburgers. Isn't that what you guys put on hamburgers? And I remember when the first time I went to India, um, they put ketchup on everything. So... Uh, they, they were very excited. They took me to a place for breakfast that they thought had a very American breakfast. They, they thought I would like that. You know, of course, I'm in India. I'd like to eat Indian food, but they thought it. So they, they, it was French toast with ketchup. That's it. You know, they squirt the ketchup. They, that's the way they eat French toast, right? So that diverse background will result in diverse ideas. So if you're going to collaborate, it's, it's great. Collaborate with someone rather than no one, but if possible, collaborate with people that are not like you, don't have your experience, so you can get their whole imagination network going as well. Okay, uh, let's see. Would you do six and seven on your worksheet, please? Would you individually fill out number six and seven? And we haven't shared four, five, six, or seven. Is that right? We didn't share four and five. So let's take a minute, find a partner, and share what you wrote down for four, five, six, seven. Four, five, six, seven. Let's move on. So we know we want to collaborate. Let's talk about sleep. Yeah. So there's a wonderful book called Why We Sleep which is, has all the research on, on not only why we sleep, but why sleep is so important. Uh, it's actually um, a really scary book to read because you read it and you go, oh, wow, okay, I've already ruined a lot. I've been not having enough sleep for the last 20, 30 years. And uh, in some ways, you can't back up and fix that. But I would really recommend that book. And I really recommend that unless you get a lot of sleep, you get more. Uh, you really need to be sleeping seven to eight hours a night in order to be fully functioning, not only mentally, but physically. And, and uh, uh, so how many people in the room don't get seven to eight hours a night? Yeah, I mean, this is uh, the, the whole, at least the whole US is pretty much sleep deprived. This really hurts your physical health and your creativity and your mental health. Um, so. Try and get more sleep. Uh, if you have to take, you know, power naps to do it, take power, take naps. It's better to get seven to eight hours at one shot, but at least napping will help some. What happens? One of the things, one of the main reasons we sleep is you consolidate information, you consolidate memories, 
and you decide what to let go of, it's actually extremely important in the creative process to sleep. Uh, and I know how many of you have ever had the experience of you know, waking up first thing in the morning and it's like, oh, there I got the answer, right? I mean, because that can also happen. Your imagination network and your salience network are still working while you're sleeping. And they will really kick in as soon as you wake up. Before, you know, because what happens when you wake up? You know, you wake up, if you're like me, you're a little foggy, you're really, fo I'm really foggy for like a whole hour. It takes, I'm very slow to wake up. And some people, you know, just bounce out of bed and they're awake. But usually when you wake up, there's this twilight area that you're not fully conscious, so, which means your executive attention network is not yet engaged, which means your imagination network and your salience network are, are very active. So that it, all that information has been consolidated at sleep, and then you wake almost awake, and then that's an opportunity where a lot of ideas come. Um, so again, that's another really good time to have that pad of paper or the phone you know, near you to capture ideas when, as soon as you wake up. Um, so let's see. I have another thing for you to do. So getting a clean piece of paper or a clean coffee filter to write on or a, uh, uh, your phone for notes. I have going to have two activities I'm going to ask you to do ask you to do this alone, on your own, not with a partner. OK, so here's the first one. And I'm going to give you about probably about 30 seconds for each. So here's the first one. Make a list of things that are the color white. So if you would do that on your own, as many as you can think of. OK, you can stop. And now I'm going to ask you to do another similar task, but make a separate list. Make a list of food that is the color white. You can begin, OK? You can stop. So did you feel a difference in what it felt like? It's like um, what, what usually happens is, in the first instance, where it was just a list of things that are white, it's almost like your engines are a little slow to get going. It's like white. OK, let's see. A shirt can be white. Snow is white. Like you're coming up with ideas, but it's almost like jug, jug. But when I say make a list of food that's white, it's like, oh yeah, OK, milk and cheese. And you know, you, it just seems easier. Did you find that to be true? Some of you, maybe. Some of you, maybe not. So one of the things that we kind of get a mythology going about is, that, is the idea of constraints. So we, kind of, we don't like constraints. If we're going to be creative, I, don't want to, I want freedom. I don't want constraints. But the research is pretty clear, that is very clear, actually, that when you put constraints on, the task is easier, not harder, even though we don't like. Now, obviously, if we put so many constraints on, like I want you to, to write a song, however, you cannot use uh, you know, uh, any, uh, I write jazz. So if you said to me, write, write a jazz song, but you can't use any seventh chords, you can't use any augmented chords, you can't use any, you know, it'd be like, OK, this is going to be, you know, it has to be four bars long. You know, if you put too many constraints on, it'll be interesting, but it might be really tough. But some constraints helps. How many of you were in the, um, uh, the music session this morning with the, uh, crazy musician guys. Are any of the crazy musician guys in the room? No? It was really fun. Wasn't it fun? Uh, and they, they had, uh, you know, you just came up and you took an instrument that maybe you knew how to play and maybe you didn't know how to play. And, and then they had you just make music and they recorded it. Apparently, we're all going to be famous. But um, <laughs> they had, well, they, did, they wanted us to feel free. So they didn't call them constraints. They called them suggestions. <laughs> But basically, they had rules you know, about when we were going to play and when we were supposed to get louder or not. Very easy things to follow based on who was standing in a quadrant. It was lots of fun. Um, but it, what I was thinking about that, because uh, I was doing it as well. And it made it easier that they gave us some rules to follow. Because otherwise, they're like, OK, what do I do? Should I be playing? Should I not be playing? But now I knew that if the guy was standing in my area, I was supposed to play. And you know, if the little wind-up toy got closer to me, I was supposed to play louder. And that actually made it easier 
because I kind of knew what to do. And it made me feel actually more free because I was less self-conscious and it was like, I just have to follow these simple rules and that will get me going. So don't be afraid of constraints. Constraints can actually increase creativity. And one of the things that I would suggest is if you are stuck on a particular project or solving a particular problem or whatever it is you're working on, if you feel like I'm not getting anywhere, I've just been, I've been circling around and around and around on this thing, try giving yourself some constraints. It might be a constraint of time. I'm going to work on this for half an hour, and that's it. And then I'm taking a break. Right? Or it might be a constraint on material or it might, you know, whatever, whatever the constraint is. Try actually imposing a constraint and it might help you break through a block that you, that you have. All right, let me see. Uh, let's do on your worksheet numbers eight and nine. Fill out, please, numbers eight and nine. Uh, any of you, what, did any of you, um, either yourself or maybe put, have your kids go through Suzuki music? Do we have any Suzuki music people? A few. Uh, m uh, my kids went through the Suzuki program. They have a, a phrase I really like, which is only practice on the days you eat, <laughs> which means practice every day, right? And I, I kind of like that one. So practicing is really, really important. And... I want to talk about um, making habits around your practice and around your process. So um, a habit is a conditioned response. A habit is, if any of you studied psychology and you studied about Pavlov and the dogs would, you know, they'd, you'd give them some food and then you'd uh, pair the the sound of a bell with the food and then when they heard the sound of the bell, they would start salivating. We uh, have an enormous number of conditioned responses in our life. You know, what do you do when you wake up in the morning? You, you probably have this pattern you do. You know, I wake up in the morning and I, I brush my teeth and then I make the coffee, right? Uh, the way you get to work, probably the very similar route you walk or you drive. We have lots and lots of habits in our life that got created unconsciously. We don't even think about them. People think it's hard to create a habit, it's actually very easy. That's why we have hundreds of them that we don't even remember creating. And one of the things that happens with habits is uh, if you can establish a habit, for instance, around your creative process, it means that when you walk into the room where you do this thing that you do, and when you, uh, if you, if you have a, you know, when I'm gonna work on my music, I go into this room, and I bring, a, I make a cup of tea, and I put the tea down, and I put my headphones on, and this is my like little ritual. That's actually a signal to my brain, oh, we're working on music now, instead of all the many, many other things that I do. So if you can create a habit about where you work and how you work and when you work, or, or any kind of, you don't have to do all of that, but some kind of habitual way, it's a signal to your body and your mind, that's what we're doing right now. We're working on this. And it'll make it easier. If you, if you wait until inspiration strikes, it may never strike. You know, it's like, yeah, you know, I'll go work on the song when I get an idea about a song, right? Well, okay, but what if I don't get an idea about a song? If I say I'm going to go work on a song and I go into the room and I have the cup of tea, then inspiration may start opening up and coming. Um, and all of you, you know, if you've done creative work, you know sometimes how hard it can be when you're working on something and you don't really feel like working on it and you don't feel like you're making much progress. But uh, sometimes it's important to just go into the space and do something, even if that something is, today I'm going to clean up the space where I do my creative work, right? That's still part of it. I know when I, I write a lot of books, and so that's a, a creative process. And there are days when, you know, I'm the, in, the stuff is flowing, and the ideas are flowing, and the words are flowing, and there are other days when I, you know, spend an hour on one paragraph and keep thinking of ways to go distract myself. And 
My house is really clean when I'm working on a book. My, you know, my husband will come home and sometimes he'll go, oh, are we working on a book? You know, because it's like all of a sudden the house got clean. Yeah, I, there's lots of ways I, I can distract myself. But it's still sometimes important that you go and, and you practice. You know, um, one of the things we mentioned was that that imagination network is working from your knowledge, right? That base of knowledge. It's sifting through your knowledge and experiences. The more knowledge and experience you have, the more it has to work with. So part of being creative uh, is just getting more knowledge about stuff. And it doesn't even have to be exactly about you know, what you're working on. So for instance, um, you know, I write jazz, and I listen to jazz, and, and that's important, and that builds up my knowledge base. And I study this about, you know, chord structure, and that builds up my knowledge base. But, you know, I, I've also gotten some interesting ideas from watching the TV series Songland, which is not at all about jazz, but it's just about people who write songs, and about, it's about pop songs which I don't know very much about, but that's added to my knowledge. It's just, there's all kinds of things that you can add to your knowledge base that you don't have to figure out how it's gonna fit in. Your imagination network is gonna figure that out for you. But the more stuff you know, and the more things that you do, the more creative that you can be. Um, so I'm gonna have you fill out numbers 10 and 11 on your sheet. And then I have one last thing I want you to write down that isn't a question on your sheet. I would like you to write down one thing you're gonna try out as a result of all the stuff we've talked about. I want you to pick one thing that you're gonna try in the next 30 days. One thing. And write that down at the bottom of your after the last question. One thing you're going to do or research or try out in the next 30 days as a result of what we've been talking about. And then this is the last chance to share. So again, you can share with the person next to you, or if you want to get up and find someone new to share with, I want you to share 8, 9, 10, 11, and the one thing. 8, 9, 10, 11, and the one thing you're going to try out 30 days. So find someone to share with, someone new or someone old. 8, 9, 10, 11, and the one thing. OK, so if I can uh, bring you back to the main room. Back to the uh, main room here. So um, in a minute, we're going to have uh, Q&A. So be thinking about questions you want to ask. Um, I hope that uh, I've been able to accomplish the, a little bit of the three things. One, that I've explained how the brain works with creativity. Um, the second one, that given you some ideas and tips and techniques of how to work better with it. And three, hopefully with your worksheets, you've got some really concrete things that you might want to try out and do differently. I want to give you some ideas of where to go to learn more information if you're interested. We have um, a whole bunch of online video courses, uh, uh, some of which are uh, germane to the things we've been talking about here, some of which are free. Uh, so if you're interested, you might want to check that out. Uh, and there's a uh, brain science fundamentals course that's free, uh, and so on. And we actually do have um, a course on the science of creativity, which is just what we've done here, uh, if you're interested in that. You guys know it already, but maybe you want to share it with someone else. We also do a podcast um, called Human Tech. It's a, a combination of what we know about people and uh, about technology. Um, of course, that's free. It's a podcast. And uh, we have a bunch of books we've written um, that were mentioned before. And uh, I do want to point out um, the blue one called I Love You, Now Read This Book, which is not the book that I wrote. It's a book that my business partner, who's also my son, wrote. Um, and it has a subtitle. It's about human decision making and behavioral economics. Uh, and that's the latest book out. So um, that is uh, what I have to share with you. And I guess we are ready for Q&A, right?
about 10 minutes of Q&A we have. Do we have a microphone person running around with a microphone? Yes, we do. OK, he's there. He's ready. Any questions for me? Or did I use up every piece of, oh, we have a question up front. Um, over here. Um, well, I was just wondering, and maybe I don't want to make you repeat yourself, but um, when you were talking about the imagination network, I thought it was interesting that you said that it is unconscious because um, I think of, like, when I think of imagining things, I often think of being deliberate about it and actually attending to what you're imagining. So um, is a, you were saying that like the executive attention and imagination are kind of like when you're using one, the other one isn't working as much? Yeah, so remember that the imagination network is a particular term for particular parts of the brain being active mm -hmm. um, that Neuroscientists, you know, made up the term for those brain. So that it might not be the same as what you're thinking of as I'm deliberately imagining things. Um, actually, when when you are kind of imagining different things deliberately, um, that's actually uh, a, another brain network that we didn't talk about, which is called, believe it or not, the default network. Such a weird thing, but actually, most of the time. Our brains are like, we're like, you know, when you're daydreaming, imagining things, that's actually um, kind of the, that's the default mode of your brain. Um, but yes, I did say that the imagination network, which is largely unconscious, is uh, as soon as your executive network, and I'm pointing here because it's a lot of where that is, as soon as your executive attention network comes in, everything else kind of gets quiet while it's focusing. So is the imagination network thing kind of like those just different thoughts that are coming into your mind about um, No, no. The imagination network is that sifting okay. through knowledge and experience you have to solve particular problems. That's all happening without you realizing it. Okay. Thank you. Um, so say you're a person who has a lot of different interests. Is this like I have a friend? The, the friend is me. Okay, <laughs> that's what I thought. Okay. So I've got a lot of different interests in a lot of different fields, and I have such a hard time narrowing down and focusing on these things that I want to get done, and it's, it's it, they end up just not getting done. How, how would you go about narrowing things down? Or yeah, yeah. So, you know, when that happens, you've really got two things going on. One is you're making your executive attention network jump around a lot. And, you know, because you're, oh, this would be good. I could work on this. Oh, this would be good. I could work on this. And so every time you do that, again, that re-engages your imagination network, but it never gives the imagination network and the salience network enough time to, to come up with anything. So, um, and then the other thing that's going on is it's really a lack of constraints, isn't it? Because it's like, I could work on this, I could work on that, I could work on this. So I think um, uh, part of it is, uh, believe it or not, I think sometimes this might come from a sense of wanting perfection. Uh, I want to do whatever it is I'm going to do. I want to really do it. I want it to be really good. And, I want, and so... I, you know, you never undertake anything because you can't devote all your time and attention to this one thing. So I would say put constraints on yourself. Just pick one and go with it and give yourself the freedom to say, no, actually, I don't like that one. I don't like where it's going. I'm going to put that aside. I'm going to work on this one instead. I think it's a, uh, sometimes it's a, a fear that we're going to pick the wrong thing. We're going to go in the wrong direction. But there really isn't a wrong direction, right? There's like, this is the direction I'm in. Uh, and I think if you put some constraints on yourself and you say, you know, for the next six months, I'm just going to work on this. And I might have other good ideas, and that's great. And I can write them down and have them over here for the future. But I'm going to give this idea, you know, two days, five days, six months, whatever you think it needs, and just see how far down you can go. And the other stuff will still be there when you, when you come back out.
That's what I would suggest. Okay. My question is about the key point you made with the more experience that you have, that you have more things to draw from, to be more creative. But my thought was that children have so much creativity. And they would obviously not have as much experience as adults. Can you address a little bit about the variance between a child's creative um, play versus what an adult might have to revisit or relearn? Um, I, the type of creativity, I mean, the process is going to be the same, the three networks. But definitely, you know, the body of knowledge from the, that the Imagination Network is going to use is going to be much smaller the, the younger you are because the less experience you have. Now, in some ways, that puts its own constraints on, right? Um, which is maybe why the younger you are, the more creative you might be. There's all, there's all kinds of interesting stuff that happens when you're younger. Uh, I'll just throw one I idea out to you, um, more brain stuff. Uh, when you go through puberty, I bet you didn't think we were going to talk about puberty today, right? <laughs> when you go through puberty, you know, there's, we all know there's all kinds of hormones and brain, there's, your, your brain is bathed in a different set of chemicals as you're going through puberty. One of the things that happens is um, your uh, neuron, neuron networks get pruned back in puberty. So before puberty, you... Uh, and, and new information that comes in about anything grows a new neuron network. After puberty, it doesn't. When new information comes in, it has to like find a home that's already there. If you think about things like, uh, how many of you uh, learned a foreign language before puberty? Anybody? Wow. Nobody? Wow. OK, so you won't understand how this feels then. Um, uh, if you had just a little bit of language exposure to another language before you hit puberty, and then later on in life you go to learn that language, it will be much easier than if you had never had any exposure. So any of you who have tried to learn a foreign language, if you didn't learn, it's hard, right? I mean, it, because you're learning it in a totally different way. So I'm bringing this up because the brain works really differently before puberty than after puberty. But these brain networks would still be the same. So what's going to happen is that the children will have less experience and knowledge to work from. But they have more freedom. They, uh, unless they've been through trauma, they uh, won't have such a fear of failure. As adults, we're just, you know, we were so hard on ourselves. Um, they, their executive attention network is less likely for most children, some are different, less likely to keep switching and focusing. You know, they're like, they do one thing and then they go and do it, you know? And they, it's like they don't, they aren't saying to themselves, oh, but now, now I should concentrate on this, you know? They're, and so they have more time. They're just, um, they're not as hard on themselves in terms of the creative process. But it, it is different than the, than adults. Yeah. I was wondering. Wait a minute. Where's the voice coming from? Oh, thank you. It's like the voice. Yes. It's one of the. How do people pick constraints? You know, I, you had us make a list. But yeah. What is the best way to start to narrow that list or develop the list and just choose the constraint? Even I imagine that's hard for some people to, you know, just pick even the constraint. Um. Yeah. I think. Uh, well. Yeah. <laughs> I think it is individual to each person. I'm a huge, um, I'm one of these list people, you know, like I love having lists. So I would probably make a list of all the possible constraints, and then I would just pick one, just pick one of the things on the list. So, uh, you know, the typical constraints, it depends on what you're working on. Time uh, is a typical constraint. Uh, material. Like physically, the material you're going to use is a is a possible constraint. Um, uh, I'm trying to think what location, you know, where you're working, the process you're going to follow, um, 
the scale of what you're working on. You know, for example, if I'm writing a book and it's like really kind of big and overwhelming, it's like, well, actually, why don't you just work on this one little part of one little chapter? It's like, stop thinking about the whole organization of the book, and yeah, you're going to have to figure that out. But why today, why don't we just work on this one little idea, right? So it really depends on the project, what a possible constraint would be. Yes? I had a question about when um, kind of venturing into creativity can feel very vulnerable, and that vulnerability is kind of experienced as uh, fear or pain for some people. Like, I find, I do a lot of drawing and stuff, and I find that even getting people to get the pencil onto the paper and make a mark can just be so hard, and it looks like they're experiencing fear or pain or something that's going with this. And I think that singing, drawing, and dancing seem to be like three that really regularly get that response out of people. But um, I know that I find myself butting up against that when I see people experiencing a lot of joy and freedom in their creative field. And I'm just like, I don't even know how to get into that water with you. I'm just terrified of sticking my toes in. So I'm just wondering, like, from a brain perspective, why is it that it's, um, why do we respond with kind of fear? Why does it feel painful sometimes to even breach that wall? <laughs> yeah, no, it's really, and um, there's, there's a lot of reasons for it. I mean, basically, I think, well, there's a lot of different reasons why that might happen. I think for a lot of people, it is fear of being vulnerable. It's fear of um, uh, criticism. You know, it's fear that you're going to do this thing, and then someone else is going to look at it and go, really? That's, that's what you came up with, you know? Um, it's, uh, I mean, I know with me, with writing music, I mean, it's incredibly vulnerable, and it's been a very hard thing for me to, I mean, on the one hand, I, I want uh, to hear my song. It's interesting when you write music, because I write music and I sing, but it's like I'm not an entire orchestra or jazz band. So if I ever want to hear what I've created, I have somebody else to be willing to play it. You know, I need to get a jazz band willing to play it. And you think, well, just go hire a jazz band. And sometimes that's harder than, than you think. And it's also very vulnerable. Like, OK, I'm going to hire like professional jazz musicians and ask them to play this chart and what if they play it and you know are secretly rolling or maybe not so secretly rolling their eyes or like oh god listen to this tune you know um, or I have to sing it and I can kind of sing but I am not you know a great singer and so you know people will make fun of me and they'll you know it's like a what a vanity, pro I mean, there's like, you just, there's this never ending soundtrack you give to yourself. And I think what's interesting and with, the, with what you mentioned was, you know, for if you do draw easily or compose easily, it's hard to sometimes understand what's wrong with the, you know, just take the pencil and draw something. It's like not a big deal. But if they're, you know, fearful of it, um, then it is a big deal. And I think it's also, um, you know, do you know about the imposter syndrome? You know, where it's like, well, you know, they'll find out that I really don't know what I'm doing, you know. And everybody's walking around, you know, they're going to find out that I'm not really an expert. You know? um, I mean, I don't know. Uh, I remember I was uh, almost done with my PhD, and it was just such a big deal. I finally had this trusted friend. And, and I think I confessed to him something like, you know, I think the fact that I, like, got into this program and I, I think it was, like, someone made a mistake somewhere. Like, I'm not even sure I actually was supposed to graduate. I think I might have been a credit short graduating from undergraduate. And so I really shouldn't be here. And if, you know, like, I'm almost about my PhD, but, you know, I shouldn't. And he looked at me and he said, you're kidding me, right? And I'm like, what? He said, do you know about the imposter syndrome? I was like, the what? He said, we all feel that way. You know, everyone who's getting a PhD at this school is going through exactly. And it's like, 
really? You know, here was this big secret I had that maybe I wasn't supposed to be here. And it's like, no, everybody's doing the same thing. So I think that that helps get, perhaps get over that when you are with other people who are kind of all struggling or all fearful um, to just do it and get it out there. And of course, it's a, it's a huge help when someone you, uh, if indeed someone you, you know, look up to actually says, hey, this is pretty good. So I, I live in Wisconsin, and there's a, a jazz singer um, named Janet Planet. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of her. Um, and uh, she did a concert in uh, Wausau, where, near where I live. And she had asked me beforehand, she said, can I sing two of your songs in my concert? And I was like, what? She's like, I really like some of your music. I'd like to sing two of the songs in the concert. And I'm like, OK. And uh, that was just, it was like, I, and I'm still like sitting there thinking, I wonder if this is OK, you know? And you know, she doing this just to be nice. And I think you know, my husband even said, oh, She's probably doing it because blah, 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 you know, and it's like, no, wait, she might really like the song, you know. Uh, so, th so it's like you need something like that to start to break down your own insecurities about it. Okay, thank you. Are we uh, all done? We are, we are done with time. Thank you guys very much. Thanks for all your hard work. Okay. Okay. So our next breakout sessions are at 4 o'clock, so we'll be in all three rooms at 4 o'clock.